Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church in the Join Heirs Sunday School class, or we call it the Adult Bible class. Glad you're here this morning with us. We want to continue in our study of the book of Philippians, and I hope you've been able to go to the graceline.net webpage, and you can get a copy of the outline of the passage that we'll be studying this morning. You know, many years ago, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, what lies behind you and what lies in front of you pales in comparison to what lies inside of you. And this is exactly Paul's point for much of his Christian theology, because it really is important that we understand not only what is inside of us and who we are, but who resides within us. And that is one of the, quote, spiritual secrets that the Apostle Paul writes about in many of his letters. So we shouldn't be surprised to know that he's going to write about it here in the book of Philippians. Now, as you recall, in our study in the past, we've been looking at different sections of this book. We've moved through the joy in service, the joy in sub submission, and we've been spending some time on the joy of salvation, beginning in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, we have seen Paul has set us up by looking at chapters 1 and 2 to talk to us about a danger to the church that's inside. The inside danger has to do with behavioral issues, issues of selfishness and conflict and strife. These are problems that are endemic to any church. And so Paul realizes that this is a problem in the Philippian church. He writes to them to try to correct it. But when we get to chapter 3, Paul begins to turn the corner because he's aware of another danger. And that's a danger that's coming from outside the church. And that is not simply behavioral issues, although those are involved. It is a theological issue. It has to do with the role of the law in the life of a believer. So Paul is dealing with a twofold problem, both from inside and outside the church. Now, we saw last week in chapter 3 that we're looking at Paul's magnificent obsession. And he realizes and he warns us about the danger of the flesh. He, he, ten, he then turns our attention to dependence upon the Savior. And then this week, we're going to talk about the desire of the saint. Now, before we get there, let's keep in mind behind us, Paul has asked these Philippians, he's requested, he's ordered them with an imperative that they live out their heavenly citizenship. And then he concluded that section by ordering them through an imperative, work out your salvation. Now we have seen that the word salvation can have a variety of meanings given its context. It can have a temporal salvation at a physical level, or it can have a eternal concept at a spiritual level. We tend to talk about salvation and the idea of I got saved. And that's true. We have been saved. But also Paul and the other others in the New Testament talk about the concept of being saved. That has to do with sanctification. But also there's this idea that one day we will be saved. That has to do with glorification. So Paul has, has and does, especially in the book of Romans, he talks about the idea of salvation being a past act, justification, a present act, sanctification, and a future situation he calls glorification. All of this has to do with sin. Justification delivers us from the penalty of sin. Sanctification delivers us from the power of sin. And one day we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. Well, Paul is focusing on that sanctification part. He's mentioned the justification. Now he's going to lead us into the sanctification. So Paul has a very important thing to tell us theologically. He wants us to beware of a danger that is outside the church. So he begins in chapter 3, as we saw last week. He gives us two imperatives. One, rejoice in the Lord. This is a theme that Paul uses throughout this book. So it's an imperative. Rejoice, be joyful. Rejoice, be joyful. Rejoice, be joyful. Rejoice. But then there's a second imperative. 
beware. And Paul says, beware of the dogs. Notice it's in the plural. Beware of the evil workers. It's in the plural. Beware of the mutilation. It's in the singular. Paul is talking about our old friends, and I use friends advisedly, the Judaizers. Those were people, some were believers, some were not, who said you had to, if you believed in Jesus, that was fine, but you also had to be circumcised. And Paul wrestled with these people that he calls dogs, evil workers. They're a party of the mutilation party. He says, beware of them. Beware of them. Beware of them. The Apostle Paul deals with these people in a variety of ways in different books of the Bible, but Judaizers, Judaizers were all around the area, coming in before Paul, behind Paul, confusing the church. Well, Paul was not confused, because we saw last time, Paul says, well, listen, you all want to talk about boasting? Verse 4, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, and let me tell you what I could boast in. He says, circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, Paul was a strict uh, adherence to the Jewish legal system of the nation of Israel. He was a direct descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Hebrew son of Hebrew parents. He was the purest of the pure, and to make it even more difficult to outrule him, he was one of the rulers. He was part of the Pharisaical group. As to the law, a Pharisee, and talk about zealous, a persecutor of the church. It was the Apostle Paul himself who hated Christianity so much, though, so he went after believers. He even stood in observing the stoning of Stephen with tremendous approval. And then finally, Paul says, in terms of the law, righteous. Not that he always did everything right, but when he transgressed, he'd go and he'd pull out the right sacrificial offering. So if anybody wants to boast, Paul says, me too. If anybody thinks they are keeping the law, me too. But look at what he says about that law keeping. Look at verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Look how Paul puts this. Whatever gain was gained to me, nothing. I consider it actually to be a loss for the sole purpose that I might gain the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus my Lord. The loss, I consider it dung, excrement. It is, it is worthless that I might gain Christ. Notice the style that Paul has written this in. It's called a chiastic structure. A, B, C. C is the main point. And then he backs out for repetition, B prime, A prime. This is a typical writing uh, way to help you understand and memorize what the writer was saying. Here's Paul saying, I want you to remember this. But what does Paul want? Look at verse 9. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul says, I put no confidence in his works. These accomplishments are derived from the law to attain justification before God, but he says there's only one justification of value, and that comes from faith in Christ. It's what we call the imputed righteousness of Christ. Paul says the works of the flesh and the power that he had and the prestige that he had and the position that he had, he said, I considered that rubbish trash, dung, 
scubala. That's just a harsh word, isn't it? Scubala. It's trash. It's dung. Paul says, all my works are rubbish compared to the righteousness that comes to me through Christ. Now, Paul talks about this in a variety of passages in his writings. He talks about a positional righteousness, and he's going to talk about practical righteousness, and that's what's coming up. But right now, remember, Paul's point is people are not justified by works of the law. No, but only through faith in Christ. We who have believed in him are justified and not by works of the law. What Paul is talking about is the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's what Romans is all about. Impute means to reckon over to one's account. God imputes Christ's righteousness to the one who believes. It's only the righteousness that is the only uh, value before God for justification. It has nothing to do with my prestige before men, my position, the abilities I have, nothing. Why? Because God's standard is perfection, and I don't meet that. And so, because I couldn't meet it, God did. And that's the beauty of this very important word in the middle of our little portrait here, propitiation. Propitiation, the atoning sacrifice. It is a substitution. It re realizes that I am now reconciled to God. I've been redeemed to God because of the substitutionary sacrificial atonement. I am justified by faith. And that's why Paul says in Romans 3, then what becomes of boasting? It's excluded by the law. By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we behold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You don't find this in Islam. You don't find this in Judaism. You don't find this in Hinduism. You don't find this in Buddha. You don't find this in any other religion because those are all man-made religions. But what you find is the grace of God that allows us to be justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Martin Luther put it well. He said, at the same time, simultaneously, I am both just and a sinner. Just us and peccator. Simultaneously, God allows me to come to him and to have a new accounting. In fact, it's what Paul says in Romans 4. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was counted, reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. But to the one who does not work, but trusts he who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works. See what Paul is saying? To be reckoned righteous, it's not by works. It's by faith. It's by belief. It's by trusting in the finished work of Christ. That is what justifies a man or a woman in the eyes of God. And so theologically what takes place is for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the great reversal. This is God saying, all right, all of my sin, Fred Shea's sin, is imputed to God. And all of God's righteousness is imputed to me. This is the great reversal. This is a great transformation. Key word, transformed. We're all familiar with Romans 12 too, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a mental transformation. Second Corinthians 3, uh, 18, we're transformed from glory to glory. That's a spiritual transformation. Philippians later on is going to talk about a bodily transformation that will come about 
in the future. So the purpose of the Christian life, once we've been justified by faith alone, is to continue this transformation through what we call sanctification. And that is what Paul is now getting to in this new section. So back in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, verse 10, that I might know him, or it's actually translated, to know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed, there's our word, conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on, in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, this passage has been hotly debated. Now, just a superficial reading of it, we realize that Paul's talking about resurrection, suffering and death, and then resurrection. But I think he's got that, but a little bit more going on. He talks about the power of his resurrection. Now, there's your word, resurrection. Then he talks about participation in his sufferings, likeness of his death. But then he goes right back to resurrection. But notice he uses a different word for resurrection and a different word for dead. So notice... Paul's looking for the power of his resurrection as I participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that I might attain. This is a subjunctive mood. In order that I might attain, that's a subjunctive mood with a conditional particle, that I might attain to the, not just the word resurrection, it's the word out resurrection from the dead. So if somehow I might attain to this out-resurrection from the dead. Well, now, is the word resurrection the same as the word out-resurrection? Is he talking about the same thing? Well, first thing we notice is that there are two words for dead, necros and thanatos. They can both be used literally. They can both be used figuratively, both be used in terms of life and death physically, both in terms of a spiritual element. But what in the world does Paul mean by the out-resurrection? He's using a term that's almost never used again. So how do we understand it? So this is what we would call a problem passage. This is a problem passage. Now, when you come to a problem passage, you need to make sure that you examine all of the evidence. We have to examine all the evidence and expose our minds to all the options and the rival interpretations. So we have to open up and say, okay, well, what is a possible meaning of the out-resurrection? Well, what's a plausible meaning? I mean, a lot of things are possible, but what's plausible? Or what's potential? Or what's probable? And finally, what's preferable? as we look at all the evidence, what might be perhaps the best evidence to come up with the best solution? So I've given us five options to look at. Now, I think a couple of them are clearly not true, although lots of people believe them, but a couple of them are very possible, very probable, and maybe I think I prefer, prefer one over the other, but we'll take a look. The first one is called the uh, the salvation or the eternal life view. Now, here's a quote from William Randall Johnson. This is part of his thesis at Dallas Seminary. He says of this verse, Paul seeks salvation if perhaps he may attain to the resurrection from the dead. By the way, notice he doesn't use the word out resurrection. He just uses the regular word. As long as his attitude is always on the goal and the striving required to reach it, he may have relative assurance of reaching it. 
Should he ever stop running, resisting in his present achievements, or should he begin a lifestyle of habitual sin? Such would be an indication that he might not truly know God. Do you understand what this is saying? As long as Paul has the right attitude and he doesn't sin too much, as long as he is always striving for the goal, then there's a good chance he's saved. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't agree with this interpretation at all. With this interpretation, then what happens when Paul stops striving really, 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 really hard? What happens when he starts sinning a little bit too much each day? He should therefore there not think that he's saved. Maybe he never really was saved. That's what this view is saying. So I think this is a very uh, problematic view, to say the least. The second view is what would be called the eternal insecurity view. This is held by a variety of people called Arminians. This is Arminian theology. Many in the Roman Catholic Church would hold to this. It simply says that this is Paul the believer, but if Paul stops running, if Paul starts sinning, then he proves he lost his salvation. Not that he never had it, like the first view, but that he never but that he had it, but then he lost it. That would be the second view. So two very important views. The first one is the Calvinistic view. The second one is the Arminian view. The first one says, if you don't strive and don't achieve, that proves you weren't saved. The Arminian view says, if you stop striving and stop achieving, that proves you lose your eternal life. Now, a third view is what is called the martyr view. And this view understands that Paul's uncertainty is in regards to martyrdom. Ernst Lohmeyer suggests that the whole epistle is an exhortation to martyrdom by the one who is on the brink of martyrdom himself. Lohmeyer uses this key to unlock a secret, uh, the secrets of the passage. He says, quote, the results of martyrdom, which Paul cannot be absolutely certain of obtaining, is the special resurrection from the dead before other Christians, which is the prerogative of the martyr. So he seems to wrap the whole passage around this concept of martyrdom. Now that's possible. I don't think that's the right interpretation, but I understand where he's going. A third view would be called the reward view. And I think this has some uh, very possible uh, insights for us. This view understands that the out-resurrection in context to be referring to rewards offered to those who have been found faithful. This would be in conjunction with verses 12 and 13 as Paul looks to that day that lies ahead, which he presses on toward that he might win the prize. So the prize is what's important here. So the term prize is used in the New Testament only in, in uh, our two passages. Uh, it most, fits, most naturally fits with the eternal reward interpretation. The prize can be compared with those who won by competitors in an athletic contest. The competitors in a race who lost, they weren't killed, they weren't executed, they weren't excluded from the kingdom in which they lived. They did not forfeit their citizenship, but they did, however, miss out on the prize and the special privileges attendant to it. And there are a number of passages that talk about this. Paul says, I beat my body black and blue, lest I be disqualified, because there's this prize. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. So this prize has to do with the upward call of God. Now remember, Paul's already talked in chapter 1, verse 6 and 10 and 2, 16, about this day of Christ. That day of Christ, we think, is the Bema Seat. So Paul is talking about living our life in light of the Bema seat, being found blameless, innocent, above reproach. So I think what Paul is here doing is reminding them of this reward, of this day of Christ, this Bema seat. The whole context seems to speak to an actual conditional nature to the behavior that's required by Paul for himself and others. It's a prize that needs to be earned that's in focus. Remember, there's a fundamental difference between the gift and the prize. 
A gift is free by definition. A prize you must earn. What's free is the gift of eternal life. What's earned is reward for holiness. So I believe the reward view is a very um, insightful view. I think it could hold water. I think it's very possible. And I think it, many people I know hold to this view. Many in the past have held to this view. But there's a, formal, a fourth, fifth view that we might want to call the spiritual resurrection power view. Now, the Apostle Paul, in this view, the theme of eternal rewards, it's still present. In verse 14, Paul indicates that he is striving to know Christ in his experience and to attain now to a resurrection type of life. Now, so that he might receive the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Later, the prize, as in 1 Corinthians 9, is the approval of Christ and the rewards that attend such approval. But the person who will receive those rewards in the future is received by the person who is walking in the, with the power of the out-resurrection today. In other words, Paul knows the power of the positional justification by the resurrection of Christ. Chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. That's our judicial positional justification. But Paul now says in verse 10, but I want to know now the practical power of the resurrection in my life right now. Now that takes place through sanctification. So the resurrection of Jesus is crucial to our justification and our sanctification. We are positionally declared righteous by Christ's life, overcoming death through his resurrection. But we also can and should walk in newness of his life because the power of Jesus' resurrection flows in us who have believed in him for everlasting life. How do we access that power? That's what Paul wants. So the positional, his death and life gives me eternal life, but practically the presence of the Spirit of God in my life provides the resurrection power to live out my life right now. You see, Paul is getting at that sanctification. How do we get rid of the power of sin in our life? By the risen Jesus who indwells me, allowing me to overcome the sin of the body. Now you remember, Paul was hoping to attain to a quality of, uh, hoping to attain to a quality of life here and now, which manifested resurrection power here and now. He was seeking to live now in the same manner in which he would live forever in the future. So the spiritual resurrection view posits that the, quote, out-resurrection refers to the attainment of Christ-like character in this life. This might be what Paul was talking about when he says he prayed that the, the Ephesians might be filled with the fullness of God. This perhaps is what it means to be filled with the fullness of God, walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. The experience of the resurrected power of Christ through the Holy Spirit in your life, every day of your life, moment by moment by moment. So the concept of spiritual maturity is a spiritual resurrection. This is found in Romans 6 and Romans 8. Also, this concept seems to be introduced in the chapter as one of the goals that Paul had. Remember in Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, I prefer to go be with Christ. But knowing that if I stay, it means fruitful labor for you. And knowing this, I'm convinced that I will be staying here with you. But now Paul says, heavens, if I've got to stay with you, then I want to experience the power of the resurrected Christ in my life right now through the Spirit, to overcome my dead mortal body. Because that was the problem that we all have. That is the problem that we all have. So this is the power Paul desired to gain in this life, which would result in the prize and the reward of a life to come. 
This may also be what Paul had in mind in Romans 8.11 concerning the Spirit giving life to our mortal bodies. The problem for the Christian is that he resides in a dead body. Even though he's alive, I still live in a dead house. I still live in a body of sin, Romans 7 says. But it's only the power of the Spirit that can overcome that dead body. In fact, look over to Romans chapter 6. Turn back to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 12, verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Paul's talking to believers, and he says, stop giving your body over, stop giving your mortal body over to sin. Well, how can I do that, Paul? Through the law? Chapter 7, Paul says, nope, not through the law. That'll never control the flesh. Look at Romans 8. Here's the answer. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Paul says, listen, Paul wants to know and experience this power that raised Christ from the dead as he continues to live out his life in ministry and struggle as he shares in the sufferings of Christ and is conformed to his death. That is, while his life experience is a struggle and suffering, and it might end in martyrdom, which we know it did, within his veins flows the Spirit of God empowering him, and of this empowering, he wants to know more. Paul wants to experience the power of the resurrected Christ in his life today. And when he does, he will be experiencing the out-resurrection, the select resurrection of the power of Christ in his life today, which will result in him receiving the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, many scholarly commentaries don't seem to understand this view. Historically, there are a few people who held to it, but most didn't. A very recent commentator came out named Mark Keown from... Um, New Zealand. And he wrote, this is important pastorally and theologically. Believers are sustained by the same life-generating power that raised Christ and indeed created the universe. The Spirit, Paul yearns to know that power daily in the context of suffering and even death. Ultimately, he wants to know full bodily transformation. And that's why he puts in verse 20. So yes, he's, I believe he's very close to what I'm saying. He, he wants to experience this out-resurrection through the power of the Spirit daily, which will ultimately result in a bodily transformation. Now, folks, we're talking about power. The power to take a sinner doomed to hell and take them to heaven, that's called the power of justification by faith alone. But what about the power to live the Christian life? What about the power to overcome the power of sin in your life? That is what comes about when the Spirit of God is unleashed in your life. It's, it's not the power of Jewish legalism. It's not going back to circumcision. It's certainly not the power of the Roman rule, which was all around the church, all around Paul's life. These have no power compared to the resurrected Christ, because to live is to be in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And when that takes place, we then participate in his sufferings. We're conformed to his death. We become transformed. That's our key term, transformed 
mentally, spiritually, and one day physically. So what does Paul want? He wants to know him now. He wants the power of his resurrection now. He wants the fellowship of his sufferings now. Because he wants the goal. He wants the prize. He wants the upward call of God in Christ Jesus in the future. So the Apostle Paul says, essentially what Ralph Waldo Emerson said at the beginning, what lies behind you and what lies in front of you pales in comparison to what lies inside of you. Do you realize what lies? No, better. Do you realize who resides inside of you? The Apostle Paul, two places to the Corinthians, both epistles to the same group of people who had trouble. He said, we are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit indwells us. And that's the power the power of the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells you, that is the only power by which you can live the Christian life. And we have that power because Christ lives in me. You don't have to buy a bunch of books. You don't have to go on a retreat. You don't have to go to Colorado on a silent retreat to find God and experience his power. You don't have to do that. You can be rotting in jail where Paul was, and know the power of the Spirit in your life as you read his word, as you fellowship with believers, as you meditate on his person inside of you, and you say, Jesus, Lord Jesus, I want to submit my life to you. I want to do what you want. Help me to be obedient to your word. Help me, Lord, to be patient. Help me, Lord, to be easy. Help me, Lord, to be kind. Help me, Lord, help me, Lord, be like you. And then we pray to that end and we memorize and meditate on those truths. Paul later is going to tell us in 4.8, whatever's good, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good repute, let your mind dwell on these things. When you do that, you are living the spirit-filled life. You are living out the resurrected power of Christ in your life. When we do that, Paul says, the church in the, Philipp the, Philippine, the, the Philippines church will be at peace and the church of America will be at peace and it doesn't have anything to do with COVID. It has nothing to do with, a, with an election process that's going crazy. It has nothing to do with any of these problems we're facing in our country right now. All of those things are important. All of those things deserve our thought and prayer. But the power is not a political one. The power is a personal one through the person of the Spirit indwelling your life. As we contemplate on the power of the resurrected Christ in our life, let us submit to him that we might lead a life pleasing to God. Father in heaven, help us to do that. Help us through your spirit to know the truth of your word and to experience the power of your resurrection in our life today. We come and pray this to you in Jesus, your name, until you come for us. Amen.